Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the only good thing the COVID pandemic brought us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yuan. Thank you, Professor Yuan. I know Professor Yuan when I was a graduate student back at Georgia Tech. He has been my mentor and also my support all these years. Really appreciate. And I also appreciate the invitation from Professor uh, uh, Yin that uh, I know him when he was a graduate student. <laughs> <laughs> and also, this is a very special department. I, I just realized maybe among all the universities in the United States, I know most of your faculty. Uh, you know, compared to others, like uh, Professor Zhu, I also know him for years, and also Professor Jiang, and also Professor uh, Luo, uh, Luo Hong, Hong Luo. And also, I even know one of your professors when I was a graduate student. Uh, from the electrical and the computer engineering professor Wen Ye Wang, and uh, we attended the same fellowship <laughs> back at uh, Georgia Tech. I came to this country 24 years ago. I was handed over a problem to deal with the helicopter rotor blade problems. Uh, I think Professor Yuan Nome, my uh, former advisor, he is so-called the father of uh, uh, helicopter rotor blade. And uh, the problem is that uh, for composite rotor blade, it's made of hundreds of layers. And uh, we try to come up with a good solution that uh, when we do the helicopter simulation, the entire aircraft simulation, we treat it as beans. But when you look at the details of the rotor blade, you have you know, many layers of composites have different materials. How do we come up with the uh, I create the stress analysis so that we can figure out the, the failure and fatigue related with the, the system. So that was my problem back in uh, 1998. It's only a very small portion of that uh, problem. I solved that problem, and my advisor thinks, hey, this guy is pretty fast. Then I assigned to deal with the plates and shells made of different kinds of materials, including piezoelectric materials. And when I started my uh, so I did the uh, plates and shells and thin water beans. And uh, when I did my dissertation, I found out I did so many topics. How do I write my title? It's very difficult to come up with a title because I had rotor blades, which is composite beans, then plates and shells and thin water beans. So I created a word called the dimensionally reducible structures. They are not really... When you do the models, they become one-dimensional models and two-dimensional models, not three-dimensional models. Then when I started my academic career back in 2003, at that time, model scale was a popular uh, field. And uh, micromechanics is also uh, 
uh, interesting field I get into. So I study the heterogeneous materials and structures and uh, working on the motor scale field for quite a few years. Then around 10 years ago, I found out this actually are all connected. And I created a concept called the structure genome and to link all the structure mechanics I worked on and also the micromechanics model scale skills into one uh, concept. That's what I'm going to uh, describe to you and also its recent developments. My, my former advisor told me that uh, when being there, only about 10 people understand what you wrote when you did your PhD dissertation. So this one, say, hey, maybe two or three folks can understand, but don't worry, I will try to use the basic elasticity theory to, to illustrate this concept. So first, a little bit about the background and the basic ideas. Uh, that if you are in the composite field, you know that we're dealing with systems, particularly in aerospace or mechanical applications. We're dealing with systems in the scale of meters or tens of meters, like uh, wind turbines, like fighters, like uh, airplanes and cars, helicopters. But when you're dealing with composites, the real engineering basically comes from the fiber, the carbon fiber, which has uh, diameter around five to 10 microns, much smaller than human hair. There are at least six scale there we need to cross. If you want to uh, model all the details in the structure analysis when you do the helicopter simulation, for example, that's impossible. Because if you're familiar with finite elements, you know that the, uh, even dealing with one millimeter material block, if you try to capture the uh, the fiber details at the five micron level, then you need to have at least one element of that size. Then you're talking about the millions of degrees of freedom in that model. And one millimeter cube is very small. If your eyesight not that good, you cannot even see it. And uh, one million or, or 20 million degrees of freedom, that's a huge model. And usually it will crash your abacus or, or the computer you have. So, uh, in the literature, what people usually to do is so-called uh, multi-scale modeling. I use the uh, fiber-reinforced laminate to do a simple illustration here. Basically, what we do, we take a simple unit cell to do some micro-mechanics calculation to get the so-called composite material property. If it's in, in the form of layers and lamina constants, then we use some uh, structure mechanics theory to, to do the structure level analysis. So both micromechanics and structure mechanics, they're two different subjects. There are many series developed for each and the various assumptions involved. And uh, that's what I, I did basically 10 years ago. I did two separate uh, fields. And we found out that uh, even you work on that and they try to remove all the assumptions within micromechanics and structure mechanics cross these two boundaries, the, the boundaries between Micromechanics, structure mechanics, there is a scale separation assumption. For example, that uh, have the unidirectional fiber reinforced composite. When we do this two step micromechanics in structure mechanics, you basically replace the original heterogeneous panel into a panel made of three homogeneous layers. And uh, it's okay if your fiber is indeed much smaller than the layer thickness, traditional. Uh, fiber reinforced composite uh, 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 is, is that, the, uh, uh, that is the case for them. It would be okay for the global behavior like uh, displacements, vibration, and buckling for the system, but not okay for the stress. For one simple reason that we create an artificial discontinuity between the layers. If you have perfect bonding, actually you should have reason material there. The real material discontinuity between the fiber and matrix, not between the layers. And if you have more complex system like the honeycomb sandwich structure, then you find that even that does not, even for the global behavior does not work, the displacement, the frequency, and the buckling load and all that. Because the traditional what we do, we take the honeycomb, do some kind of homogenization, get some effective 3D properties, then treat that as a homogeneous layer and do a laminate uh, analysis in a, in a sense or sandwich analysis. The reason being that now this, the size of the honeycomb is similar as your thickness. You have to do it together. 
this skill separation assumption does not work anymore. So that is the issues with the traditional button-up model scale modeling. And uh, that's when I first uh, tackled the model scale problem. I tried to think from the system perspective. That's where my PG training was. I deal with the whole helicopter system. So it's at the system level. When we look at the system level, for, for example, a complex system like Boeing 787, when you do structure analysis, you know that you idealize that it's a combination of 3D solids, pulleys, and shells, beans, and single beans. It depends on the geometry. You know, if your thickness is much smaller than the implant dimensions, whether it's curved or not, it becomes plate or shell. If it's one of the dimensions much larger than two other dimensions, it's a bean. Of course, that bean could be curved. And if all three dimensions are of similar size, it's a 3D solid. And if all three dimensions, their orders or magnitude are different, it's a same word being. And we have different series for that. We have different elements for that. And when we do a structure analysis using computers, that's what we do. And uh, as a modeler or theoretician, you, we need to realize that this, is one, this simple 1D element here represent, could be represent a box beam with, with each wall made of dozens of layers. And this surface element could represent a stiffened panel with the skin and stiffness made of different materials. And then how do we make sure that this nine element could reliably represent whatever the slender component in your structure? That's what we need to find out. And that's what the concept come in. <coughs> so we we know what we want at the system level. I want the structure to be modeled in terms of solid element being played or shear elements. We also know what it's made of at the material level. Then you find out, if you're thinking from the uh, modeling perspective, you have two models. And you want to avoid the computational cost associated with these details, but you don't want to lose the fidelity. Then what we do, but you also want the efficiency at this level, and uh, what we can think about how to minimize loss of information between these two model representations. So that's the mechanics of structure genome coming into play, and uh, that's the only motivation we have. We know the details, we want the uh, global model. And this framework or this kind of like perspective is different from the traditional model scale modeling because Traditional model scale, you find out there are single scale models with data transfer between different scales. And that's what the IC has uh, direct information passing across in scales. But now it's basically based on what we want. And you as a modeler, you decide what kind of details you want to incorporate and uh, at the affordable computational cost and uh, time for a particular design need. You, whether you want what kind of property or what kind of behavior you want, you make the decision. So based on the, this uh, principle or this uh, perspective, there are three steps when we try to approach a mechanics problem using the concept of structured genome. Uh, first, we need to figure out the kinematics. We know that for mechanical theory, you have three parts. There's kinematics, kinetics, and constitutive relations. Constitutive relations is what we want to find out because kinematics is ge geometry has been established many, many years. And also the kinetics is equilibrium, Newton's law applied to the continuum mechanics. And the constituent uh, relations is what we need to focus on. And also kinematics and kinetics, they are the same, no matter what is, uh, you know, what kind of materials you have, composites or metals, you have the same Newton's law, you have the same geometrical relations. So first we try to establish the relations between the kinematic variables of the original model, which what I denote as U here, and also the model you want is the U bar, could be the rotation of the beam, for example, and also some unknowns, like the W in instruction mechanics, we call it the uh, warping functions, but the, in, uh, in the homogenization techniques, we call it the fluctuation functions. And of course, you can get the corresponding stream variables, then you can try to find out what will be the information of the original model expressed in terms of the model you want. 
information could be general if you're talking about the elastic uh, behavior, then you're talking about the total potential energy because we know the principle of total potential energy. When you do the uh, variation, you will find the solution for the elastic system. But if you're dealing with other uh, physics or nonlinear elasticity, you will have a different information expression. And then the third step is to minimize the information between the original model expressed in terms of the kinematic, kinematic variables and also unknown functions. And, uh, and also the model uh, you want. And when you use the minimization, you can solve for the unknown. After you solve for the unknown, then you will find out the complete expression here. So you will find out that overall there is no assumptions like uh, all the Bellulli assumptions or Kochikov law assumptions or even other micromechanics, all kinds of assumptions there. And this is pretty straightforward. And if you have the basics of mechanics, I, I believe you, you should be able to understand. But the concept of the structured genome and when you apply it to an individual structured gene, actually the new concept need more explanation. For example, if we're dealing with a 3D analysis, we want at the end is 3D solid elements. Then, you know, in Abacus, you have kinematics and kinetics all coated up on what is your UMAT, right? You want the UMAT. UMAT is what the, the, when you're dealing with new materials, you need to derive. You need to derive. So based on the heterogeneous system you have, depends on how your material is made up you can figure out what will be the corresponding fundamental building block. Structure gene is defined as the uh, mathematically smallest building block of the system. For example, if you have a binary composite, a 3D solid here, the fundamental building block will be just these two segments because you can mathematically sweep this line implant to build the binary composite, then repeating the binary composite through the segments build the 3D block. If you have a fiber reinforced, unidirectional fiber reinforced composite, you're dealing with a two-dimensional domain. If you have a woven, you're dealing with a three-dimensional domain. And uh, what you want is the corresponding constituent models for the 3D elements. So carry out the one-dimensional analysis here, two-dimensional analysis here, three-dimensional analysis here, or we'll deliver you the constituent models. But we, that will help us to get this global 3D behavior, but we don't stop here. We want to find out the, when and where the material fails. So we want to find out what happens in the original heterogeneous system. So after we've done the global analysis, which can be carried out by conventional finite element codes, then we do a dehomogenization. In a sense, still through this domain, which is our ST, to find out all the streets and string components and the corresponding damage and failure status and even out of this one-dimensional analysis, we can get six stress components, okay, six string components. And also this two-dimensional analysis, we can get also all the, all the stress components. So you will find out this idea is very similar to micromechanics or the traditional uh, model scale modeling, but there's some difference. For example, some of you may be familiar with RVE analysis. <coughs> if you use this method, we don't have to worry about the boundary conditions. When you do RVE analysis, the trick part is apply the right boundary conditions. And also, it affects the results a lot. OK. And uh, there is a fundamental principle we need to satisfy, which is the Mandel condition. And uh, this method automatically satisfies the Mandel condition. And also, we don't have to do pre- and post-processing. Pre- and post-processing, what the, I mentioned here is that when you do the RVE analysis, you basically, if you want the property in a certain direction, you apply the load, usually it's uniform strain along certain directions, which is in terms of this displacement. Then you also apply boundary conditions along other directions, then calculate the stress, then you average the stress, take the stress, divide it by whatever the unit strain node you, you obtain. You will get the material property in one direction, then you do it in other directions. For linear elastic, you need to do six times to get the complete set of full uh, stiffness matrix, and this kind of pre- and post-processing is not needed. We directly compute the material properties. And the uh, second part of difference will be faster. It's semi-analytical. It will converge faster than RVE analysis. We had many examples to show that. And uh, we can compute the 3D properties 
or the stress stream field out of 1D or 2D or 3D SGs. For example, that you, uh, many of you saw this RV before when you even have a unidirectional fiber reinforced composite, you take a 3D block to get all the 3D properties, all the space components. But if you use MSG, you only need to deal with a two-dimensional domain, but we can get all the stress and strain and, and the material properties in all the three directions. And uh, also, we can compute the complete set of 3D properties out of one analysis. When you do RVE analysis, even for linear elastic, you at least need to have six times to get the stiffness matrix in different directions. And we just compute once, and we get all the properties. And also, it's more versatile. It's a single theory for all heterogeneous materials. Could be periodic, partially periodic, and uh, even uh, periodic materials. And also the SGRE usually is a rectangular or square cube, cubitorial uh, type of shape. But this one, you can be up to shape. As long as say, this block of material represents my fundamental building block of my material, contain all the constituent information I want to capture, then uh, this method can work out the results for you. And also more accurate, if it's a 3D periodic material, and uh, we can achieve the same accuracy as RVE analysis and asymptotic homogenization if you apply the periodic boundary condition in a correct way. And uh, by the way, in our method, you don't have to worry about that. And also for partial periodic or a periodic materials, you always achieve the best accuracy because it's used the principle of minimal information loss. They were gar guaranteed by our variational principle. Then that's basically the traditional macromechanics concept in a sense. We just have a more general purpose, more efficient, and also uh, systematic way of doing that macromechanics. How about if we have plate and shear type of structures? So we want to do the plate and shear analysis. For example, you want the flexure property, the bending property of a piece of two-dimensional material. Basically, you're talking, talking in terms of plate terminology. And depends on how it's made of. If it's, you have a laminate or sandwich, you have basically one dimensional domain to deal with because you can take this fundamental building block, mathematically build your laminate. If you have a corrugated plate, which has a heterogeneity along one of the implant direction, you're dealing with a 2D domain. And if you indeed have heterogeneity in both implant directions, you deal with 3D domain. Now what you want is the corresponding constituent models for your plate and shear elements in, in your traditional finite elements. Out of this 1D, 2D, and 3D, SG will deliver us all the uh, plate equivalent plate and shear property to work with as a global analysis. After you're done your global analysis, you have force and moments, curvature, and strains. You can go back to calculate all these six straight, uh, stress and strains and the corresponding damage and failure studies for each point within the original structure, the heterogeneous system. And you will find out that the same structure gene concept not only provide a systematic way to deal with all panels, as long as you have a piece of structure you want to model using plate and shear elements, this will deliver you the best relations, the reductions from the original 3D heterogeneous system to the 2D plate and shear surface element. And, uh, and also, you will find out this actually is a direct application of the micromechanics extended to two-dimensional structures. If you view the reference surface as a generalized continuum, then every point in that continuum have a corresponding microstructure to deliver its effective property and also corresponding local fields. And if you're familiar with the structure mechanics literature, you'll find out that uh, you know, we have a series for laminates, we have a series for sandwich structures, we have a series for corrugated structures, uh, we have a series also for stiffened structures. And this basically provides the same series for all the structures. And uh, my former advisor once joked me that when being you have all the papers already written, what they say is that the principle has been laid down, the rest of that just the applications. If we have time, have funding, we can do all those. I will show a few applications we did recently. And also, how about you have a slender structure like wind turbines, like 
uh, helicopter rotor blades, or even the uniaxial tensile bar, you know, you actually treat it as a beam element there. And if your uh, structure has a uniform cross section along the lens, or can be approximated as made of piecewise constant cross sections, then your SG will be the cross section. It's a two dimensional domain. If you also have heterogeneity along the reference line direction, then you're dealing with a 3D block. And what you want is a torsional and bending stiffness shear center for you to carry out the beam analysis. And uh, out of these two dimensional domains, three dimensional domain will give us the corresponding constitutive relations we, we need for the beam level analysis. And after you get the first moments, Along the beam reference line, you can also get all the stress and strain relations back. And again, you can see that uh, this concept of structure gene provides a systematic way for us to deal with the structure you want to model in terms of beam elements. And uh, you just need to treat this reference line as a generous continuum. Every material point here, you have a corresponding microstructure to deliver the effective uh, beam property and uh, also the corresponding local stress and strain state. So this pretty much about the basic concept, but I illustrate in the, in the traditional theory of elasticity and structure mechanics and also the traditional way of model scale modeling. There is another fundamental restriction of model scale modeling, if you're familiar with that, is that it must be treated as a point, as a global analysis. That's also the consequence of scale separation assumption. So one of my recent work, I tried to get rid of that restriction. We don't have to treat it as a point. So the idea is like this, okay, now instead of models, I'm not dealing with models and models and constitutive relations. I'm dealing with elements to elements. So I homogenize a heterogeneous system meshed with solid elements into a single element. Say if I have a 20 loaded, 20 load solid element, I homogenize to that element. That element still remains the same in the global analysis, so it's not a point. And we didn't have the so-called effective material properties. We have the effective element stiffness, okay? And still we can use MSG, to, I mean, the idea is the same, right? you need to answer the question, what is your heterogeneous system? What is the homogeneous system you want to achieve? They minimize loss of information between these two. And we also uh, use this concept to derive a heterogeneous B element. Instead of like what we did, get the Tim Sinkle stiffness matrix or something like that, or, or a Bellulli B stiffness matrix, we come up with the equivalent three node B element stiffness matrix. So, in other words, I will have 18 by 18 uh, stiffness matrix here, not the six by six for all of the And also for this one, if it's 20 load solid element, I will come up with a 60 by 60 effective stiffness matrix, which is the element stiffness matrix. And this way, basically, you will find out it's not a point, then basically even at the homogeneous level, the displacement and the stress and strain could be not homogeneous. It could be heterogeneous. For 20 load, you're basically up to uh, quadratic distribution for the stress and the strains. And uh, we did a few examples, and one of the paper is already published that is the heterogeneous solid element. And we compared with the abacus composite solid element and also the traditional model scale modeling still use MSG, but uh, homogenized to a point in the global analysis. You can find out that the you will find out the global deformation that uh, this, this method, the HSE, the heterogeneous solid element, performs much better. And if we look at this, is the original heterogeneous system. We use the direct numerical simulation to do a detailed analysis. Then we replaced with the new concept, basically 52 uh, HSE element. And each element actually have more than 20,000 uh, solid elements there. But this is a global analysis. You only have 52 elements. And you can look at the, not only the global uh, information, the displacement rotations. You can also look at the stress distribution, the detailed stress distribution. We have very 
uh, good capture of all the stress distribution through the heterogeneity. And also another example is on the heterogeneous bean element. You can find out that uh, we have a tapered bean. Uh, we made it homogeneous to be simple enough. So that this is a, a DNA model. And we start from 20 millimeter to 10 millimeter. And there are two ways to do it, traditional way, because when you're dealing with a tapered bean, you want to model as a bean, you have a bean element, then you cut a few cross sections to get the corresponding uh, bean stiffness to work for the bean analysis. And for our new method, basically we cut a segment or a, a, a brick, a block of the original 3D models. And uh, for each model, we, we carry out our homogenization analysis gets the effective 18 by 18 element stiffness matrix to do the one dimensional analysis here. And you can find out that for global deformation, the traditional way and also the refined way is very close, but still if you compare with DNAs, the heterogeneous B element will be better, but not significant. That's why when you do the table B analysis, the cross-section analysis, the traditional way is still mainly used in industry because they only care about the global deformation. But if you look at the stress distributions, you'll find all their difference. The traditional way, actually, you have piecewise constant distribution because when you do that homogenization, you basically made the assumption that this bean is made of full piecewise constant cross-sections. I mean, you reduce that into 1D model with a series of cross-sections. That's how wind turbines is analysis. They cut into two, you know, hundreds of stations along the span. And then you will have stress will be the exact constant distribution through the heterogeneity through the segments. But using the new heterogeneous element, you'll find out that we have almost a perfect agreement with the DNAs. And the second application is recent, uh, what we worked on is they try to provide a holistic uh, constitutive model of uh, meta materials and structures. And I know that uh, it's, uh, there are a lot of work has been done here. And uh, what we try to say is to use MSG to, to re-examine some of the problems in the field. And uh, this uh, example, some of you maybe know, I think is on the second slide. And uh, since uh, a lot of you also so work in this field, I don't have to explain what is the meta material is. Basically, you all have some strange properties which is not available in the in the property of the material used to create the meta materials or meta structure, like uh, negative Poisson ratio, like certain couplings. And in 2017, there is a science paper talking about they found out a mechanical a meta material, which is that when you compress it, you will get a twist. You know, at the three-dimensional level, indeed, it's a, a new property. But uh, if you're thinking in the correct way, you'll find out that it's actually the bean and the plate property. Because, you know, for a bean level, you, you pull it, if you have 45 or negative 45 degree layup, you pull it, you will twist. Okay, that's, that's not a big deal. And also, in that paper, if you read carefully, you find out indeed that if you have the unit cells repeating all three dimensions, this coupling will disappear. So it only appears when you only have one of the dimensions, like uh, what I'm showing here, like a bean, or have two of the dimensions, like a repeating. But if you have so, so all three dimensions, when you have more and more unit cells, then this uh, 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 extension and twist coupling will be disappear. In that paper, they use Kosra elasticity to try to model that uh, extension twist uh, behavior at the three-dimensional level. But if you think in terms of MSG, it's basically a bean-like meta structure or plate-like meta structure was they are dealing with there. And also for us, we really don't have to model the entire bean or entire plate. We only need to take take out the SG, the structure gene, then we can figure out the properties. <coughs> so we, uh, in that paper, they did the test of the so-called size effect by increase the number of N along the beam direction or the implant direction or three dimension. They try to find out whether this so-called, uh, the new property 
or new behavior, coupling behavior will disappear or not. That's the, uh, the FEA analysis they did, but uh, for us, we, to, cap, to predict the extending, extension traced behavior, we don't have to use so many unit cells. We only need to use uh, four unit cells there because that's our SG. And this is the results, and in that paper, they did the experiments, and also the FEA results also from their paper, and uh, the MSG results is here. You had, we have a pretty good agreement with the MS, uh, FEA results done uh, in that science paper, and uh, to try to examine the size effect uh, with respect to the ratio scale factor. That's the, for the being level, which means the unit cell will be repeating along one of the direction. And if you have a plate, which is the unit cell repeating along two of the dimensions, you will also have this uh, twist and bending and extension and twist behavior. But now what we deal with is the, uh, if you use our method, you're dealing, if n equal to one, you only have one unit cell, then what you want is the plate model, okay? Based on this one unit cell, you get a plate model, then there is an extension and twist coupling there. If you increase the uh, thickness and the unit cell, number of unit cells through the thickness, basically they, they hold the, the size and the, the global dimension the same, but they reduce the, the length scale of the unit cell to try to find out the size effect. And we also did a, a prediction there. You find out that the two two approaches. If you treat it as a continuum, you will not see any size effect. You know, when you add more unit cell, you reduce the size of unit cell, it does not change the uh, uh, properties you try to find out. Here you have, uh, yeah, the uh, extension and twist coupling there. Uh, if you do a continuum approach, it will always remain the same, but if you treat it as plate, you do have the size dependency of that extension bending coupling, uh, extension twist uh, coupling. And uh, I think some of you professor may also have this experience that uh, because machine learning is uh, popular and then your students were, were always uh, tempted to do machine learning, right? They always try. So I had uh, uh, a few students come to me and say, professor, we cannot do that old, boring, traditional mechanic subject anymore. I want to do machine learning. I say, it's okay, you can do machine learning, but you first find out what is problem has not been solved in our, in our mechanics of composite materials because that's our field. And uh, find this problem cannot be solved uh, analytically or you know, in the traditional way. Try to use machine learning to, to solve it. So we identify two problems. First is high computational cost. If you really want to link from the fiber all the way to, to, to the fuel sludge or to the helicopter rotor blade, you will find that the computational cost is prohibitive, prohibitive. And second is that we always have to assume some properties or even some constituent models for the constituents, right? Like fiber and matrix, you know. Uh, usually you don't have transverse property for the fiber. But when you do the model scale modeling, you need that. And also the interface between them. Those models are zoomed. So those are the two challenges. So we try to solve it. The first, of course, is the surrogate modeling uh, problem. You want to reduce the computational speed. And uh, machine learning, when you have a lot of data, and uh, you can generate a good surrogate model better than the traditional surrogate modeling techniques to, to, to map in the input and output and uh, particularly our MSG will be much faster than the traditional model scale modeling. So that will further reduce the computational cost. That's the first one. Second is that try to identify the unknown, which is what we assumed, the constituent models, the damage models, and the interface models. And how do we get that out? We try to use the hybrid uh, machine learning finite element approach. We pretty much basically break the machine learning apart, not just take a tensor flow, for example, uh, to, to have a series of data just to do the training and learning. Instead, basically, we take the machine learning apart and also take finite element apart. And we couple machine learning and finite element together, try to figure out what would be my UMAT for my applicants, for example. 
And this uh, first the example we did is the, uh, try to come up with the efficient surrogate model for thermal conductivity for woven composites so that we try to link the mic uh, micro scale effects like the fiber and volume fraction and also the woven pattern like a plane trail and, uh, and also five edges and also the spacing of the yarns and the width and thickness of the yarns. So we build a model not only related with continuous vibra, uh, variables, but also discrete variables and uh, of very different nature. And uh, that's, that's the power of machine learning. Traditional uh, uh, circuit modeling techniques usually are not capable of. And we can find out that uh, comparing with the DNAs, and we have a pretty good agreement uh, in terms of the yarn architecture and also the yarn geometry, that's the effective properties, uh, effective thermal properties we are plugged in here. This also point the fact that we're not only dealing with mechanics, we're dealing with thermal, we can also deal with electrical magnetic. Uh, remember our variational principle is the principle of information loss. Information is what is defined for the corresponding physical phenomena, not necessarily just the mechanics. And this example basically shows that uh, Usually, you know, when we do the woven composites, we assume something for the yarn. We try to get the failure criterion for the yarn. Usually, it does not exist. So if you really want to do a model scale modeling, uh, basically, you're based on fiber volume fraction to get the yarn properties and do the global analysis and uh, apply a certain node. You have to try to go back at each Gaussian point into the micro level to figure out the stress concentration to see whether the fiber or matrix or the interface failed or not. If not, then you increase load, load at the woven fabric level, do it again, again, then later you will find the failure status of the woven fabric. That's clearly a very computational extensive process. So what we want to do is to, to try to numerically figure out the failure criteria or failure envelope for the yarn uh, based on the micro level uh, simulation. That's we come up with, we, uh, we, because we use the very sophisticated Machine learning model there is a deep learning model. You will find out that the, comparing to do this two scale all physics based simulation, we have very, a very small difference there, less than 1% or around 1% for all the strings variables for the young. And if you compare the efficiency, it depends on how many Gaussian points you have and how, you're going to, how are you going to use the failure criterion for the young then you'll find out, of course, if you don't use it much, because you need to generate the significant data for the training purpose. So the uh, uh, deep learning model will be, uh, the initial uh, cost will be high, about eight hours there. But if you use the failure criterion, numerically machine learn, machine learn the failure criterion and more and more, then you'll find out that indeed, that comparing to the physics, physics based model scale simulation, that they, uh, machine learning model, the cost will remain the same. Because uh, once you learn, then it's a polynomial, okay? It's a failure criterion for the young. And uh, then you can use it again and again. This one is what I mentioned to break the, <laughs> the neural network and the finite element so that we can figure out what will be the corresponding human. Because when you do advocacy, you'll find out the, the finite element model and all that is pretty much you know, very well established and correct, but the UMAD is something you don't know when you, particularly when you go to the nonlinear and damaged behavior. And how do you, based on the measurements at the structure level to figure out the UMAD, that's basically what we are doing. We actually find out we can very accurately learn the nonlinear behavior for the, for the constitutive models. It's not only just model calibration, you have a model assumed and get some parameters. You actually learn the model itself how the curve should be behave, the straight string curve. And uh, the second part is actually is, uh, is the, how the damage progress in terms of the string. When you know your string, then you can figure out the corresponding D11, which is damage along the axial direction. And the last is to learn the damage law. And you'll find out we can simulate the nonlinear curve and figure out where there will be uh, damage and uh, uh, this is still couple the composite mechanics and uh, along with the machine learning to 
uh, figure out the unfigurable because there are so many failure criteria in the uh, in the field in the literature and so many damage law and uh, uh, material degradation laws and those are all human assumed. The, uh, a lot of them even not based on thermodynamics. Here I can based on whatever measured at the structure level to figure out what happened at the material level. That's the power of machine learning. And last part is also a very important part of me as a professor is technology transfer. You will say pretty unique. And uh, I'm, usually I didn't stop at the theory and the published papers. I, my focus is to deliver code to change the industry. And uh, I have the code put available on the cloud. It's free to use. And you can use your smartphone to do our analysis, even woven or sandwich structure, honeycomb, uh, much faster than the RVE analysis and also the results. Uh, it will be as good as if not better as your RVE analysis. And uh, we also have an app. You can go to your smartphone. You search for SwiftCon. You can download our app. And uh, those are all free to use. And we recently finished the uh, project with Army. And uh, they have a helicopter design system. But what they have is the system level design and the simulation. They can come up with a blade with the corresponding stiffness and inertia. But they don't know if it's manufacturable or not. We insert the module in terms of our theory. Basically, they give us the target stiffness in the inertial properties, and we try to manufacture a blade virtually strong and uh, stiff enough to satisfy the performance and also light enough. So that's what, uh, what we did recently, just finished this summer. And we also integrate our code with Katia. You have a win or you have a structure, you can take a card it will, uh, of the SG, then it will bring up the shear center. It will tell you where it is and also the torsional stiffness of that structure. That's a very intuitive. We also integrate with HyperMesh and OptiStruck, and that interface done by Altair, and also available through the Altair Partner Alliance, if you have Altair license. And we also integrate it with Abacus, and it's a plugin you download and insert, then you can do your much smarter and clever, powerful RVE analysis if you want to call that way. We also integrated with ANSYS and uh, Python Nastran. Python Nastran is a uh, integration is done by, uh, uh, by collaboration with Spirit because what they have is a traditional uh, Python Nastran is can only deal with unidirectional fiber reinforced composites, but they are airframes and uh, aerospace structures that are made of woven fabric. So we enable the woven fabric capability in that traditional finite element code. And we also had uh, many other applications I don't have time to, to show here, like uh, the uh, deployable structures, and like uh, the multi-scale uh, design of tailorable composites and uh, with NASA. And uh, for the sake of time, I, I don't have uh, if you are interested that uh, you're welcome to talk with me more after the talk. So as a conclusion, the mechanics of structure genome, you know, uh, it, it breaks the, <laughs> breaks the gap between the material structures and can be used to harvest the full benefit of the advancing materials research and development. A lot of us just stop at the 3D material level. You'll find out, you know, for example, you make a rotor plate. What you really care about is the natural frequency when you do the design. That's and the fatigue life of the, uh, of the rotor plate. You have to play with material and geometry, you know, even material layout together. And uh, don't just stop at the young modules level. You will lose a lot of benefit it can bring by the advanced, uh, the, a lot of advanced made in materials. So the, the idea here is that they don't, uh, and you know, unnecessarily truncate this process. Look at the final product performance and uh, link them together theoretically, not only just uh, numerically. And also provides a unified model modeling for structures, materials, featuring anisotropy and heterogeneity. It, uh, this uh, theory help us eliminate invalid scale separation assumption. I said sometimes scale separation is valid, sometimes they are not valid. And also assumptions within scales. 
all kinds of assumptions made in micromechanics and also structural mechanics. Uh, this method all eliminates them. And uh, we had many examples showing that it can achieve DNA's accuracy as the efficiency of engineering models. And also enables us to model composites, not only composites, all heterogeneous materials. And we didn't make a particular assumption of the microstructure if you see our theory. So we can model all heterogeneous systems as simple as the homogeneous systems, capture details as needed and affordable. And also another uh, attraction of our method is that we work with the conventional structure tools. You can still use your favorite Mac, you know, uh, Abacus Ansys Nestrin. Power is traditional structure tools, and uh, with this plug-in, you can do the high fidelity constituent modeling for new materials. What does that mean? That basically uh, help us to infuse whatever the advance in materials technology into the early stage of the preliminary consideration of your system. You don't have to basically already have pretty much the system fixed, then just changes a small piece you know, whatever the, you, you want for meta materials technology have. It, it can, at the very early profession, uh, conceptual and preliminary design stage, we can, hey, let me try the, the new meta materials Professor Yin just uh, proposed to see how it will affect the flutter envelope of the airplane. And we can do that because you, it's directly linked with Nastrin. We can do that too. And also, last but not least, particularly as academia, uh, a university professor, I like this the most. It unifies micromechanics and all kinds of structure mechanics series. And uh, I don't know whether you read this book or not. It's from Jacob Bronowski, the, read, the creative aspects of science. He says that the, the progress of science is a discovery at each step, a new order which gives unity to what had long seemed unlike. Farad did this when he closed the link between electricity and mechanism, and Maxwell did it when he linked both, both with the light, and Einstein linked time with space mass with energy. And science is nothing else than the search to discover unity in the wide variety of nature. That's a very important concept where, you know, even politically we, we emphasize diversity so much, right? But we forgot the unity. We forgot what the university means, yeah? University is the university, okay? It's seek unity among all the diversities. Otherwise, you have no foundation for your diversities. It's also the same thing happening in our you know, mechanics series. There's so many series there when you go to structural mechanics and micromechanics. There's so many series. Which one I should choose? Okay, you should choose the best one. What's the foundation or the principle you judge to be the best? So I hope that <laughs> by all my work, when I retire or when I passed away, somebody will remember that I did something, try to unify all the series into one series and try to and uh, discover some other uh, in terms of the solid mechanics this micro mechanics, structure mechanics. So this is the last uh, slide showing all the different of material system we have tried before and uh, the overall goal, what we try to achieve, we try to achieve is at the structure level design and the analysis. And also we take all the advances in materials and structures concepts. And it provides a virtual testing of the materials and structures. If all you want is to say that you want to maximize your torsional stiffness yet reduce the weight, then that's the virtual testing of the material and the structure. And we can deal with mechanical structures as um, uh, uh, properties and multifunctional properties. And also, if you really want to link the structure level, like the entire helicopter simulation using archives, and still try to see what the new material uh, system can bring you into the system level performance, then we can do the Model scale modeling that they requires to link our theory into the structure tools you have, like Abacus Sciences and all that. It can deal in all, with all types of structure. Could be the traditional composites, could be stiffened structures, could be up tree, build up structures or sandwich structures. And with this, I will stop here and take any questions you may have.
Uh, that is, uh, let me say, I, I really don't want to use the equation still, still boring. I know, I know these days, particular students, they grow up with videos and, uh, and they really not used to the equations. I only have one slide of equations. Uh, let me see here. Oh, yeah, this, this one. So when you, when you have the expression, you will find out this U bar is whatever the homogeneous system you can provide, like a rotations, displacement. And this U is the heterogeneous system, the complete one. So this is kind of like a change of variable. This W is an unknown function. You don't know. For example, that, uh, you know, that uh, when you do the classical elimination theory, you, you use Koshikov assumption. You basically assume this W goes to zero, which, uh, which is not right. We, we know it's not correct. And it will create a con uh, a contradictions somewhere. So, how to find this W is the key. Well, after you find the W, you know, you can assume W. For example, the class contamination theory we assume to be linear distribution and normal remains normal. The first order shear deformation, we say, oh, maybe 90 degrees could be, you know, another 90 degrees. We all have two rotation angles. Then you could also have a third order parameter, whatever, or even piecewise theory, you name it, or zigzag theory. They are, they are all kinds. It's all basically pri at hoc, assume what is to be known because thickness is small, we will do that. Or the Beruli assumption is also like that. You know, we assume the cross section to be plain and normal. Basically, you assume the space form of W. We didn't assume. We basically use this change of variable, no assumption here, to express the information of the heterogeneous system and minimize the loss between the heterogeneous system and the homogeneous system. When we do the homogeneous uh, minimization, we try to find W. Here, in this system, you will find out U, U bar and epsilon bar is all homogeneous systems. And we try to find out the, the W. So our W is not assumed ahead of time, but solved later by ensure that whatever the information, because we know it were, there some information will be lost between the heterogeneous system and the homogeneous system. There is no free lunch. You want the efficiency, you will lose some details. We want to lose as minimal as possible. So we use that to find W. A lot of traditional theory, they don't have this step. They, at the very beginning, they assume it to be a certain parome or something. Like that. For example, the, <coughs> the Nasakalan micromechanics code, the generalized mist of cell, they assume to be a linear function. The stress will be a linear function within each subcells. Those are assumed W to be known. We, we don't assume that. We minimize whatever the homogeneous system, the heterogeneous system, the loss of information between these two. And if you, you want more details, I can send you some papers to show comparison between the classical lamination theory and the, the classical lamination theory de derived using the mechanics of structure genome. You can show the step by step there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Young. There, there are many ways to do it. And uh, for example, for, for Abacus we send, and Katia, we send our students as interns to them. And uh, Abacus already had three of my students in their R&D center. And also Nastran, and uh, usually we, we work this way. So that, uh, you know, work with those guys. We do based on their framework. But, uh, you know, we have very good relationship with them. If there are some issues, we can we can ask them. Uh, 
So now our code become a plugin. You can download through my website, the CDM Hub. And then after you download, it become kind of very integral. It is part of the menu in, in Abacus after you install it. You, you open your Abacus, it will automatically find our code and our whatever the interface we created. Yeah, there, there, there are many ways to do this so-called secondary development that is possible. And actually, my students like this much better than derive the equations. I don't know why. They think it's easier for them to find jobs. <laughs> if they work with Africa, then they get familiar with Africa. Yeah, it's more than the UMAT. It's more than the UMAT. It's basically also change their GUI system. In the GUI says you can use Python. A lot of them is Python or their internal language. Yeah, Abacus, you use, you use Python scripting, but the Abacus and the last string, they have PCL, and the answers they have, they are called APDL, I think, answers programming language. Yeah, They have a, a fundamental language. They can do scripting, and you can change the GUI and all that stuff. And also call some of the internal geometry capabilities and some of the internal pre and process, uh, post processing capabilities. Yeah. This is next slide, next slide with answers. Mm. Um, but this model is embedded into answers for mechanical analysis. Mm -hmm. Do you be able to work, uh, expand the possibility for mechanical analysis? Yeah, it's there. I mean, the capability is there, but we didn't uh, integrate with answers electrical mechanical capability. But uh, the code itself, our theory and the code can, ca you know, calculate the whatever the electrical magnetic uh, properties there. So the, some of the GUI is because it's open source. You can take it and say what we have done there. Then you link it with the electrical magnetic solver that the uh, answer size. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I do have one question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting question and also challenging question. We know that I purposely, because I'm a person kind of like a, a perfectionist, the, the failure and damage field, I try to purposely stay away from it. I, I found out there are too many of them and a lot of them just uh, assumed uh, assumptions. So our recent attempt, we did two. First is, for example, the Haishin failure criterion. What we do is based on the experimental data. We use the Hashim failure criteria as an assumption, because Hashim also did a lot of assumptions come up with that four equations. <coughs> <coughs> then to update the Hashim failure criteria, we assume maybe some of the coefficients are not right, and some of the cross turns they purposely neglect. So we use the machine learning and also Hashim failure criteria, basically use machine learning based on experimental data to update Hashim failure criteria. At the end, the design engineers still use as if for Hashim failure criteria. We, we assume Hashim did most of the work right, but uh, some of the experiments cannot match. So we can use the uh, experimental data to update an existing theory. That's the first thing we did. And second is that uh, uh, we did this. We use the machine learning based on what we measured at the structure level because you know, a lot of experiments hard to do is because if you only want to measure directly material properties, it's so hard. For example, if you have metal materials, have couplings, it's hard to do the measurements. But you can measure the structure level performance and also use machine learning to figure out what the material model and the properties going to be. And uh, we also did some uh, failure and damage stuff, because I know that the, the K in the failure and damage is K the stress and strain, right? 
if your stress and strain is not right, then whatever you did is just curve fitting. A lot of there are a lot of papers published in that uh, direction, and uh, but if you go to the industry, you find out, you know, Boeing use their own failure criteria, and uh, NACA use their own, and the so-called progress failure analysis really just in papers. They are not uh, extensively adapted in the everyday job of structural engineers in those major aerospace companies. And we also did some so-called thermodynamically consistent modeling of failure and damage. But as I said, that if you cannot get this stress and strain right at the heterogeneous level, you cannot get failure and damage right. And that require, uh, we did some work, but I still consider it preliminary. And really for somebody to uh, to adapt that, we need a serious partner like Boeing. Recently, there is a person approached me to 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 predict some virtual allowables for their system. I hope that become a serious effort. We know how to do it, but uh, uh, without the experimental data, that's just another paper exercise. Uh, we can do both. Uh, we take the we didn't do experiments ourselves that uh, to to avoid the uh, the perceived uh, bias. We take uh, if we use experimental data, we take it from the literature, uh, generally accepted good data set. We we had some of that. Uh, a lot a lot of machine learning work currently we generate numerically. We use the choose model whatever we have to do your DNAs to generate the. Uh, uh, data set that way. So there are two ways to do that. Usually experimental, when I said that the enhanced Hashim failure criterion, that paper, that is based on the worldwide failure access, that experimental data. And uh, uh, it's not a pure machine learning model because a pure machine learning model, you'll find that you need a lot of data which experiments cannot uh, provide. You do have to use some numerical simulation data there. For that work, we only upgrade an uh, uh, existing failure criterion. Then whatever that limited experiment the data is enough. Thank you. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah.